So anyhow, welcome to this session. It's content strategy tips for creating content people love. My name is Patty Swisher. I am the Vice President of Corporate Communications for IKM Architects. We are a 100-year-old architecture firm located in downtown Pittsburgh. We're actually in one PPG. We've designed things like the Hillman Cancer Center, the Phipps Conservatory Welcome Center, uh, the Fountain at PPG uh, was one of our projects. So many things around Pittsburgh. We are a regional firm. I'm also an adjunct professor here at Point Park. Uh, I teach social media, what I call 101. It's the intro to social media class at Point Park. It's a mix of graduate and undergraduate students. Um, and we touch kind of all of the basics of social media. And I'm also a co-founder of a group we call Social Media Group Pittsburgh. Uh, it was an organization designed to share best practices in social media. We've really taken just to the online version of the group these days where we have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn group. So I encourage you to search for us on both of those platforms. And if you need to, uh, I would encourage you to join as well. Can you still hear, hear me in the back? Okay. So today I put together a presentation about content. Uh, content marketing is a, a big word this year and might be actually uh, one of the key terms uh, in social media marketing, things like that, that uh, one of the buzzwords, if you, see, if you will. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit what is content strategy. Really, the meat of the presentation is about 10 tips to create content that people love. And then if we have time, I can't make any promises, I'll do a little bit of an intro uh, to a content calendar, but I, it's really the meat of the presentation is around the 10 tips. So the big question is, how do we create content people love? And if you were here for John's uh, opening keynote this morning, it ties in perfectly well with this presentation, because he touched upon many of the things that I will talk about today regarding content. We're all familiar with this tweet, the selfie uh, that was taken at the awards show. And we would all like to have um, that much recognition for our tweets as well. Uh, this is content marketing. It's about building your reputation, showing your expertise, your character, and demonstrating your communication skills through the content that you provide. What is content? Content can be the tweets that you share, the blog posts that John talked about, the podcasts that you create, the uh, Facebook posts, cover page images, the Instagram posts that you create, all of those things become the content. And if you're a small business, this, this all ties into your content marketing. It's how you get the word out to your key influencers or your key purchasers of your product and share with them your message about that content. So then if that's what content is, what is content strategy? Content strategy is the planning for the creation and delivery of that content to your audiences. Content strategies really should be scalable. Whether you're a one-person business, a 10-person business, a 500-person business, your content strategy really needs to be scalable to those uh, audiences that you are trying to reach. And what you really need to do is take a step back and understand what your business goals, resources, workflow, what those things that you already have in place are, and how you want to tie your messages into those ideas. Content strategy usually starts with a really big picture. What is your overall goal that you want to achieve? Do you want to be known as an expert, as the Jagoff is, right? And it drills down to really the, uh, the bits and pieces that you can implement. This, of course, is a picture here at Point Park of the fabulously renovated plaza. So that's a little bit about what content strategy is. Let's talk about tips to get your content, to create the content that people love. So what I want you to ask yourself as we go through these variety of tips, ask yourself, what do people love? These are the tips that we're going to talk about, shareable, interactive, consistent, all of those things, but from your own personal perspective, the content that you're producing, what do people love about it? So the first thing that people love is shareable content, right? How many times do we come across something 
and we think of two or three or four or ten people that we have to share it with, right? These uh, examples are from Tumblr. You search puppies and kitties, which happens to be seems to be a theme around here today a little bit, um, with the duck feet and the kitty paws and things like that. Um, puppies and kitties are wildly popular. Uh, we all know Grumpy Cat, right? It's because we make an emotional connection. When we see those images, we immediately connect with them all. Right, honey? You, you see a cute picture. Cute baby. Cute puppy or kitty. You can also look to trending subjects. Um, appeal to your audience's values. These are all ideas that create content or allow content to be more shareable. And then think of it in terms of creating a, a series of things around those trending subjects and around your key ideas um, that might have some real breakout potential with your audiences. So think in terms of shareable content to create content people love. Here is a trending topic. It was a week ago that we played the New York Rangers. How many Penguin fans in the audience? Yes, no, not too many. I have to love Penguins. Uh, if you watched the game, not last night, but a week ago where we played the Rangers, Mr. Malkin put a vicious hit on Girardi and it was easily uh, during the end of the game that Girardi became a uh, trending topic and there was YouTube and video clips all over Twitter uh, with the actual uh, hit. Uh, and then everybody was tagging on. So it became very shareable content. The next idea or tip for creating content people love is collaboration, collaborative content. So think about your content and what about it can become collaborative. When you are thinking in terms of collaboration, I would encourage you to think about connecting with established creators. There's always someone that might have an audience that's slightly bigger than yours that really ties to your mission. And whenever you connect and collaborate with those people, you're able to expand the reach of your content. But when you do collaborate with others, you have to think about still being original and authentic to your own mission. You need to really research collaborators that make sense. So if you're a donut shop, it doesn't make sense to collaborate with an auto parts store. Right? You need to collaborate with uh, similar interest audiences. And then you also need to remember to honor collaborators' existing reputations, particularly if you're reaching out to uh, a collaborator that has a much greater audience than yours and you're interested in doing a guest blog post. You really need to be respectful of them. Here are some examples of blogs in particular that have a uh, the actual guidelines, contributor guidelines, if you do want to be a guest blogger. Uh, HubSpot, if you're familiar with them, a popular vendor. Kuno Creative is just a, a blog and I think a marketing type agency. And then the one at the very bottom that you may or not be, be able to read is Mark Schaefer. He writes the Grow blog. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Mark Schaefer. He's also written multiple books on social media. Mark doesn't accept any blog posts from any person or company that he does not personally know or that do not follow the Grow blog. So if you're thinking as, of collaboration as an opportunity to expand the reach of your content, then you might need to do a little bit of work before you actually reach out to make those connections to collaborate. You need to participate. You need to follow along. You need to offer something in return so that it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But collaboration is a great way to create content that people love. Well, the next tip is to make your content discoverable. And very much like John said in his opening keynote, I don't know anything about search. If you're here for search, you need to go to another session because I can't tell you how to optimize for search. But I'm sure there's all sorts of key ways that you can optimize your content for search. Keywords is one of the big ways that I try to do things. The way you name things or tag things it should certainly help with search. But I am by no means an expert in search. But how else do you make your content discoverable? 
trending events is a big win. Now, planning for trending events is a little bit more difficult than actually capitalizing on trending events happening at the time. And then evergreen content. How many of you know already what evergreen content is? Evergreen content is essentially a word that means the content that can stand on its own regardless of when it was published. So those blog posts that don't need a date, that they last forever and ever, that they're always relevant. Blog posts such as how-to video or posts. So here's another trending topic example. We, have, we all lived through the polar vortex, which was the winter of 2013 into 2014. And it almost seems like we're living through it again today, and hopefully we're approaching a warm-up now. But even Stephen Colbert captured on the polar vortex, and it was a trending topic, and there's an adorable cartoon that references the Pittsburgh Pirates in the snow. But how, if you're a small business, if you're a small financial planner, how do you capitalize on the polar vortex? Well, maybe it's a blog post about how to survive financially during the polar vortex. That's, that's the idea of latching on to a keyword to create content that resonates with audiences larger than your immediate audience alone. So we mentioned evergreen content. Yearly posts. If you do an annual post, that's the five trends for 2014, five marketing trends for 2015 the five things that you need to know about A, B, or C, whatever your topic is. That would be a yearly post that you could update every year, and it becomes essentially an evergreen type of content. Interviews. John talked about interviews in his uh, opening keynote. You can always come up with a new interview and tie it back to your mission and your message. Sometimes it might need to be a little bit creative, but that's not a bad thing either. The how-to posts are wildly popular. You know, how to do this, how to do that. Um, typically, people are going and searching because they have a problem and they need a solution. A how-to post offers a direct connection to a solution. So if you're looking, if you're asking yourself, how do I create content people love? I can say, well, I can create a how-to post. How to use my product or service to solve a particular problem. The history of something is always a good idea for a how-to post. User tips and frequently asked questions, testimonials, reviews, other ideas for a how-to post. This is Jeff Bullis. He is a blogger from Australia. Uh, this is his version of a how-to post. It's actually how I did something, and essentially the inference is how you can too. So this is an example of a, a how-to post that would last, would be a type of evergreen content uh, that you can share. The next tip to create content people love is accessibility. People want to be able to access the content. And what does that mean? Each piece has to stand alone. So if you find a post, if you find a video, it has to be able to stand on its own. That's what makes it a, a good content. Uh, but it also, if it works together, with a series of posts. That extends the reach, it extends the uh, visibility of the content that you're sharing. So sometimes you have to provide a little bit of context or a quick recap. If you are doing something that is a three-part series or a five-part series, um, you can refer to the post before or the post after, uh, and that will certainly help. But essentially, your pieces should be able to stand on their own. This is an example of a Facebook campaign we actually ran for my business. Um, we had won a national award, um, and it was for our young professional development program. And so we thought it would be a great idea to feature the young professionals. Uh, not only would it be touting our own horn that we actually won the award, but it would also be giving credit to the individuals um, who had directly benefited. So when we were going out to recruit new hires, this would be a positive reflection of the firm. And after the initial post of all the faces, then we would go on to another idea that we shared was the testimonials. So the individuals that actually benefited from the award 
and give a testimonial. And there was a corresponding uh, one minute video with interview with each of these people as well. People like to see people's faces too. I think they respond well whenever there's an actual person. So it was a very successful campaign for us, and it's just one idea of how something that might not be so exciting, a professional services firm ways of an award, generally who cares, right? Um, but this is a way to get it out there to our audience and to say, hey, we're doing good things here. And if you're looking for a job, new graduate, you might want to look at our firm as well. Consistency is the next tip. So if you're thinking to yourself, how do I create content that people love? You need to be consistent. I mentioned that he blogs every day. That's a really tough thing to do if you've ever tried. But you also have to be consistent with your format, the elements of your posts or your content, and your voice. I'm sure you're all familiar with voice, how you have to establish your own voice, the voice that is, is honestly and authentically you. And that comes out through practice, um, and you can't really fake that. Uh, it, it sort of makes itself known. But you do have to be consistent. So these are a couple examples of, I was trying to find things that were consistent um, as far as content. This is actually Reagan.com. I don't know if you're familiar. It's a marketing and PR online site. They do a lot of social media. Uh, and if you get just a quick glimpse of a screen capture, you can see how they're very consistent with their uh, formatting. And obviously the tools that we use help us to do that, but sometimes the creative person in us uh, uh, wants us to go astray a little bit and to do something new and exciting because we ourselves get tired of seeing the same routine, uh, post after post, layout after layout, and we really need to switch it up a little bit. And I would say caution yourself and try not to do that too much because your audience likes consistency. This is Hinge Marketing. They are a professional services marketing agency. Um, so they cater to uh, the marketers for doctors and lawyers and accountants and also architects and engineers. And then this is um, just one example from uh, Fuel Lines, which is a blog for ad agency new business. And we'll talk a little bit more about Fuel Lines in the future. So why do you need to be consistent? If you're trying to create content that people love, you need to be consistent because it compels your audience to return. It's like delivering on a brand promise. If we all think about McDonald's or Starbucks, we have a certain expectation when we go into those venues that we will receive a certain level of service and a certain level of product. That consistency compels us to return because we have expectations and we expect them to be met. So you need to do the same with your content. When somebody finds something that they like, or that is genuinely of interest to them, then they will come back to your space expecting that same level of quality. Therefore, ultimately, uh, that increases loyalty. We all know all the people that are addicted to Starbucks, and they will only go to Starbucks, they won't go to Crazy Mocha, and they won't go to Dunkin' Donuts. They have to get their cappuccino from Starbucks. And so it does develop a certain expectation. Your audience develops a certain expectation of, of what they want to see from your posts. So that helps to build that consistency, to create the content that they've come to expect from you. So some best practices for consistency. You can express ideas over multiple posts. Again, perhaps you do one quick post that says, these are the top 10 things you should know for 2014. But then from that, you can build out 10 more posts capitalize on each one of those things and expand on those things, and you can express them over multiple posts. Again, formatting. If you have a structured format, try not to reinvent the wheel every time. While you might become bored of it, your audience comes to expect it, and the consistency is important to them. And then schedule, schedule, schedule. It's very important to create an expectation of when the next post will be. It helps people to know when they need to go back, when they need to look for you, when they need to look for that next post. 
If they're always guessing, they're going to get tired of guessing and they're not going to come back. Obviously a clear point of view and it should always reflect your brand. That sort of goes to voice as well. So the next idea is targeting. There's been a lot of talk about buyer personas. Have you all heard that term, buyer personas? Essentially, buyer personas is identifying your target audience. If you are in the business of selling a product or service, you can generally identify who the people are that are most likely to buy your product, or the people that you want to buy your product. That's targeting your audience. And once you understand if if Bill the buyer is a 65-year-old male who has a college education and makes fifty dollars to $100,000 in annual income and he watches ESPN and he follows the Steelers and the Penguins, then you have an idea of what type of content you can target toward that audience. So this is the Fuel Lines blog. This is Michael Gass. He is the uh, author of the Fuel Lines blog. And it is a blog that provides new business resources for advertising, digital media, and PR agencies. He is very specific in who his target audience is. And he generally doesn't deviate from that. So if you look at a collection of his blog posts, nearly every one of them say for ad agency new business. There's just a couple of the, of the last. So every time he tweets, he always includes for ad agency new business. Every one of his blog post titles say for ad agency new business. There's no confusion about who his target audience is. He is very consistent in his posts. I happen to like his blog because I don't think it's just for ad agency new business. As a professional services firm, I'm able to expand his ideas to an area that impacts my business and it enables me to get a different point of view or a different perspective from a marketing perspective that agencies might offer uh, and just tips that other people might not be looking for because they don't think that it applies to them. So here's another hot button buzzword that's been around for a little bit, sustainability. Typically sustainability talks about green, oh, at least in my world, sustainability talks about green buildings and green products and products that are good for the environment. In this case, sustainability means for the long term, right? To create content people love, you have to think about creating content for the long term, content that you can sustain over time. You have to understand if you have the resources. You know, if you're going to undertake a podcast, do you have the resources to produce a podcast regularly? sounds like a great idea and it sounds like a hot topic, but are you really personally able or do you have the resources in your business or in your office that can produce that over time? When putting a slide deck together, it's really hard to come up with examples that are relevant to an audience that you're not really sure is going to be comprised of. And so I struggled a little bit when I was trying to come up with sustainability ideas. But then it hit me. This is, a, this is PodCamp, this is about social media, this is about online, this is about tools and techniques, this is about how, learning how to do it better. So Razor Social was the perfect example for that. Razor Social is a blog by Ian Theory, who is a gentleman from Ireland, and he has a blog that's about using tools and technology. We all know that there's no shortage of tools in social media. They, pop up every day. Somebody's trying to make the discovery. Somebody's trying to be the one that sells their tool to Facebook to make their uh, billion dollar payout. Ian's blog always talks about the latest tools and technology. So it's very specific. And it's very sustainable at this point. We don't see any time in the future where people are not going to be creating tools and technology to help us do our jobs better. And then this is one of my other favorites on Instagram. Uh, you know, when you're going to take, undertake an Instagram campaign for your business, uh, and I assume these, these people's business is food, and quite frankly, my world revol revolves around food. I don't know anybody that really doesn't love food. Um, 
So they have their account name as Love Food. And it's really a sustainable idea, right? There's no shortage of photos that you can take of food. Kind of looks like some of the breakfast offerings we had today. And then who doesn't love a gooey chocolate chip cookie, right? So really, when you're thinking sustainability, you have to think about, can you do this for 12 months? Can you do this for two years? Can you continue this? Is this a sustainable idea? Um, I have heard in the past, if you're considering taking a blog, that you should uh, write down 25 blog titles before you write one post. If you can't come up with 25 titles, then you shouldn't begin under that idea. It's an idea of making it sustainable. The next tip is conversational. You need to make your content conversational. The whole idea of social media is social. And if you're trying to get your message out there, then you want to give your fans a chance to participate and connect. Um, we talked about emotional connection with the puppies and the kitties, right? And then you should ask for feedback and ask for response. But the idea of making it conversational allows everybody to be heard, as John said earlier. People want to be heard. So if you give them a forum where they can be heard, they will feel more loyal and more apt to engage with content that is conversational. Back in March of 2014, there was this big push on a lot of popular blogs to discontinue comments. The comments were being overrun with spam. So on this side, we have uh, the uh, anti-social media blog and their announcement on March 17th that they were turning off comments to their blog because there was just entirely too much spam on their comments. It was no longer worth it, and they were having a difficult time monitoring what comments were real and what comments were spam. So as a response to that, the Spin Sucks blog by Ginny Dietrich said, we're not turning our comments off. We like your comments. We need your comments. We need you to contribute to our community. So Ginny identified the trending topic of turning off blog comments and said, hey, if you want to comment, come over here. Come to our community. We want to hear what you have to say. The next tip about creating content people love is to make it interactive. The more you can make it interactive, and again, give the fans an opportunity to participate, the more people will like it, share it, spread the word, and love the content that you produce. Obviously, comments are one way to do that, and user-generated content is another way. Ask people to take photos of your product you use. Share it with you. Ask people to take videos using your product or service. Ask people to take a, a video of the problem that they're having that you want your product to solve. That way, all of the production of content doesn't necessarily fall on you, and the ideas for creating new content doesn't necessarily fall on you. It engages your audience and gives them an opportunity to connect. So what are some examples of that? Here again is some Instagram examples. Um, two accounts that I follow, the Daily Travelettes and Building Shots. The Daily Travelettes has something called um, the Daily Travelettes Instagram Daily Challenge. And they create a hashtag, and at the beginning of a month, they produce a list of, this happens to be the fall version, they produce a list of 31 items that you can post on each day. Um, for instance, this being fall looks like it's October that they ran this program. And the first one is a change of colors. So they ask their audience to, to post to Instagram uh, an image for each of those days, the first day being a change of colors, wish the ha with the hashtag Daily Travelettes. Then you can search Daily Travelettes hashtag and see all of the posts that people have created for that day. And it continues consecutively for the 31 days, with 31 in this instance being trick or treat. It, it challenges you to be creative uh, with your response, to see how others are being creative with theirs, and also to participate as a member of the community. So if you have an Instagram account for your business or, or your personal professional service, 
think about creating a, an Instagram daily challenge to engage your audience uh, and ask them to create user-generated content and buzz around your particular topic. The other side is building shots, and through their hashtag, they create uh, photography challenges, which is perfect for Instagram, of course, uh, and ask people to share with that particular hashtag. And who does better user-generated content than GoPro, right? The, the video cameras that you can attach to your dog, or your uh, skateboard helmet, or your surfboard, or your ski helmet, uh, now that we're into the winter. But GoPro asks for users to submit their GoPro videos. And therefore, they're engaging their community for user-generated content. Uh, and it doesn't, again, all fall on them. It engages the people. It gives them an opportunity to come back and say, hey, did they pick my video this month? And they'll continue to go back <coughs> after they submitted it. And people are exciting and want to outdo each other. And last but not least, and this is very much what John was talking about when he said be genuine. I happen to choose the term authentic. Be authentic. You have to be true to your voice. And you're talking about something that you're passionate about, that will come out in the way that you share your information. Uh, if you choose something that you're passionate about, it will become apparent. And it's a good way to create content that people love. If you show real life stories, uh, and make your message relatable. Maybe somebody else is going through the same thing that you're going through, um, and you share real life stories, real life challenges that you've had to overcome. It, it creates a sense of authenticity of who you are. You're a real person behind it. As John said, when he shared his face with his blog, it just started to happen because people could then identify with him as a person and not just this blog of writings. And then sometimes you have to share the backstory. If you share the behind the scenes or the how to, um, if you share the backstory of how you got to where you were, again, that also adds a level of authenticity to your content that enables people to connect with you on a more personal level. A couple of just quick examples of authenticity. Uh, again, struggling with the challenge to come up with uh, ideas. Uh, I'm sure most of us are aware of the Super Bowl commercial, which now lives on YouTube as a piece of content for Budweiser. But how authentic that it is for Budweiser to use the Clydesdales in their commercial, and then the emotion that this particular commercial created uh, with the audience. It said that uh, everybody from military heroes to moms to children had tears in their eyes when they saw this commercial because it just really resonated with them. And then this is a more of a techie type uh, example. I don't know if you're familiar with Moz.com, uh, Grand Fishkin. They produce uh, what they call, every Friday they produce a video they call Whiteboard Fridays. And it's really about SEO. This one happens to be top of funnel uh, marketing channels and content creation and curation and things like that. But it's, it's very true to who their brand is. They don't try to be emotional and pulling your heartstrings. They're very techy. And every Friday, that they're consistent, consistently posting on Friday, they produce a video uh, that is true to their brand. It, it helps them to be authentic. So you have to ask yourself, what content do your people love? This is my lucky girl. It's not hard to see. She's sleeping. She'll be a Instagram post for me in the very near future as she is very regularly because puppies and kitties always play well. So I think that's all that I have as far as tips for creating content people love. We talked about shareable content, collaborative content, uh, discoverable topics, accessibility, consistency, understanding your audience, sustainability, conversational, interactive, and authentic. Does anybody have any questions about tips that, for content, creating content that people love? I think we have a couple minutes. And if you would like, I can talk a little bit about the content calendar. Yes, no, yes? A little bit about the content calendar? 
So essentially, when I, I like to talk about content calendars, I like to say make it easy on yourself. Just don't try to reinvent the wheel. And the best way to do a content calendar is to start by laying out every month. I personally like to do it on a big 11 by 17 or a big tear off pad where you write the name of the month on the top of the content calendar on the top of each sheet. So January, February, March, April. First thing you do is identify all of the special occasions that happen in each of those months. And then understand how you can tie your content to that particular special occasion. Then you figure out, can you do a how-to every month? Right? Can you do one how-to posts each month related to your particular content? Can you do an interview or a testimonial every month? So fill that in. And you start to build your content calendar from there. Once you have the big ideas, it helps guide each little piece that you want to create, and it gives you a point of reference to go back to. So for instance, um, January, right? It's right around the corner. We can start planning for content for January. Identify things that happen in January. Obviously, there's New Year's. With New Year's comes resolutions. Also in January comes predictions, right? So when you're creating content for your subject, how can you tie those three big themes into the content that you produce in January? By doing those three big themes, you will automatically be attaching to pseudo-trending subjects. They might not be the official trending subjects on Twitter for that particular day, but you will see a wealth of posts around those ideas so that when people are looking for subjects around predictions or resolutions, uh, your topic will also be included in that content. And you continue to do that throughout the months. And really by identifying those highlights, you can fill out a content calendar related to your content. That's all I have. Any questions? John? From, a, from an organizational standpoint, how hard was it for you to teach your organization the importance of social media and show the value? I um, just did it, and they are coming along as we go. Um, I just started to produce social media, um, and it, what really helped for my business was when they would go out and other people would respond to our social media posts, and they would get third-party endorsements about what we were doing and how we were doing it right. Um, that helped my effort more than any sales pitch that I could make. Yes? Yeah, and I just want to follow up on that. Something else we did um, was every new employee that came in, they got trained, that was part of their orientation, just like it was in one of the CMS or whatever it was. And the other thing was, we made it very clear that we expected every employee to follow us on social media. Mm -hmm. And we would put out like announcements that weren't made announcements, but stuff that they would only learn if they found out on social media. So that really would have helped too. I, I use that, I use that idea as well. We post things to our Facebook page. Our Facebook right now is really for family and friends of our business. Um, it's not, the Facebook in particular is not for clients so much, um, but there is information that we post only on Facebook and you can only see on Facebook. So, if you want to be in the know, that's where you got to be. Anybody else have any questions about content? Well, it's just a little brief introduction with the calendar. Um, I think the agencies have a lot more on content calendars than I not sure if anybody else here today is sharing about content calendars, but I'm happy to talk to you separately if you would like. Yes? I don't know if this is really on topic, so you can tell me it's fine. It's okay. But, so I'm a personal coach, uh -huh. a professional life coach, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh -huh. um, and I'm hesitant to really jump on the social media bandwagon because, well, it's me, right? So it, it's like my... I'm my product, I, I am my right, service. Right, right, you are the brand. Right, so, I mean, I want to be authentic. I also, like, there's certain things I would want my clients to see. Uh, like, how much of my, you know, talking about having consistent content, how much of my personal life really should be in my social media to make myself, you know, seem human? I would always err to the side of professional. 
Um, however, if you have a particular hobby, for instance, that it relates to being a, a better person in whatever form of coaching that you do, say that you are an avid bike rider. And by being an avid bike rider, that allows you to clear your head and think strategically about things. Then you might share uh, posts that are related to what you thought about on a bike ride that relates to your coaching. Yep. Make sense? Yep. Anybody else? Yes? As, as you brought the social media into your organization, uh -huh. um, are there policies and guidelines that you've got to try to establish so that you kind of keep it in the same range even though you've got maybe other employees who are trying to participate? Sure. Um, we have, our business has about 40 employees, so we're not a very large business. We're actually technically considered a small business. Um, and I'm really the only one that posts on behalf of the company. The way the employees participate is by sharing and commenting on those posts. We have created a social media policy, and if you uh, just Google social media policies or guidelines, there is a whole website that offers links to very large companies' social media policies. Um, and you can take and pull from those um, the bits and pieces that pertain to your business uh, so that you don't, again, have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I offered our guidelines to the principal owners of our firm, and I suggested to them that they have them reviewed legally, uh, but they were very comfortable with the policies that we put in place and very supportive of the fact that I'm the one that posts, everybody else shares and contributes that way. And I welcome any um, content contributions to the posting, but I'm the one that creates the voice. So that's how we maintain the consistency. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. You can ask a follow-up, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have any questions? All right, I'm done. You're free to go. Thank you.